person who helped get that foundation off the ground and also concluded it, do you feel like that trilogy would have benefited from planning out a very strict three movie story from the very beginning? Or do you enjoy that kind of creative freedom to kind of take the characters different ways and kind of see how it goes? A few moments later. But having a plan, you know, I have learned in some cases the hard way um, is the most, you know, critical thing because otherwise you don't know what you're setting up. You don't know what you're, you know, uh, what to emphasize, because if you don't know the inevitable of the story, you know, you're, you're just as good as your last, you know, sequence or, or effect or joke or whatever, but you want to be leading to something inevitable. Don't worry, we'll get to that later. Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, is the final chapter of the almost universally loved Star Wars sequel trilogy. After the divisive nature of Star Wars The Last Jedi, there was a lot of pressure on the writer and director J.J. Abrams to deliver something special. Could he please the fans that felt disenfranchised by The Last Jedi? Could he please the fans that loved the first two Star Wars sequel movies passionately? Would this movie wrap up the sequel trilogy while, as the marketing suggested, serve as a conclusion? conclusion to a nine movie saga. Hello everybody and welcome to another video. My name is The Goldman and today we're going to talk about Star Wars Episode 9 The Rise of Skywalker all these years later. To begin this video, it's only fair that we talk about the most controversial aspect of this movie, and that is Palpatine's return. Frankly, one's enjoyment of this movie almost entirely depends on whether or not Palpatine's return works for you. Almost everything that happens in this movie stems in some way from Palpatine coming back to life. There are a large contingent of people that love Palpatine's return, and I am genuinely happy for you. But the execution of his return arguably derailed the entire trilogy for most people. The Rise of Skywalker as a whole is a prime example of how a cool concept can't overpower execution. But before I talk about the execution of his return, I want to discuss the most disliked part of Palpatine's return, how it retroactively affects Return of the Jedi. At the end of that movie, Darth Vader sacrificed his life to murder the Emperor and save his son. With the context of the prequels, we now know that Anakin fulfilled his Chosen One prophecy and brought back balance to the Force. People love to point out that with the return of Palpatine, it has nullified the fulfillment of the Chosen One prophecy. And this is kinda true, but also kinda false. One could look at the prophecy and say that Anakin still did fulfill the prophecy. He did bring balance to the Force, just not forever. The prophecy never said that he would bring balance to the Force forever. This is a valid interpretation, but is it really satisfying? Does the climax of Return of the Jedi feel the same knowing the prophecy meant that balance would only be restored for a few decades? No, it doesn't. So while you can argue that the the prophecy wasn't ruined, it was without a doubt at least diminished. But I am here to tell you that I don't give a flying fuck. I have a passionate hatred for the Chosen One prophecy. I'm sorry prequel fans, I think this is one of the dumbest parts of that trilogy. In the originals, there was never any mention of some prophecy. Luke was just the son of a man who used to be a Jedi, and when Vader turned back to the light side, it was great because he saved his son, not because he fulfilled some random prophecy. Also, when you really think about it, the Chosen One prophecy doesn't even really matter. But Goldman, the only reason Qui-Gon took Anakin was because he was the Chosen One. Fair enough. But riddle me this. Instead of making Anakin the Chosen One who will bring back balance to the Force, just make him someone who is really strong with the Force. If Qui-Gon shows up to Tatooine and simply sees that Anakin is uber strong, that will be enough to take him back to Coruscant and nothing changes. Now come Revenge of the Sith, the reason Palpatine manipulates him is not because he's some Chosen One, just because he's simply strong. If you take every line in the prequels that mentions the Chosen One and replace it with the strongest Jedi ever, the story plays out the exact same way. The only thing the prophecy accomplishes is adding unnecessary context to Return of the Jedi and handicapping stories going forward. Think about it. If Anakin brought back Balance of the Force in Return of the Jedi and that balance was supposed to last forever, then that means there can never be any dark side user in the history of Star Wars ever again after Return of the Jedi. It doesn't matter if it was Palpatine or not. The 
existence of Snoke should be something that diminishes the Chosen One prophecy. Frankly, Ben Solo turning to the dark side should diminish the Chosen One prophecy because he threw the Force out of balance. So even though I feel Palpatine's return wasn't done all that well for reasons I'll get to in a minute, none of those reasons are because the Chosen One prophecy was ruined. Now setting that aside, you can still argue that it diminishes the simple idea that Anakin killed Palpatine. Palpatine was Anakin's abuser. He manipulated him so hard that Anakin murdered his wife and nuked his life beyond repair. So without a doubt, Palpatine's death is less impactful because Anakin didn't get that satisfying revenge. But that doesn't bother me because in that moment, Vader was saving his son, not killing his Emperor. Vader turned back to the light side because of his love for his son, not his hatred for the Emperor. If Anakin getting justice against Palpatine was the emotional climax of the saga for you, then I can understand why the Rise of Skywalker would piss you off. But to me, that scene is all about Vader saving his son, and that wasn't diminished one bit. So whether or not Palpatine's return ruined Return of the Jedi for you is one thing. Let's now take the time to narratively examine the major issues with his return in just the context of the sequels. It's clear that the reason Palpatine was brought back was so Rey could have a climactic final fight. This is the third movie in the trilogy and the ninth movie in a saga. What could be more epic than Rey defeating Emperor Palpatine, the man behind everything? It couldn't be Kylo Ren because he was going to become good. It couldn't be Snoke because he was dead. So let's make it Palpatine because why not? One of the most fundamental aspects of storytelling is setup and payoff. If you want a moment to deeply resonate with the viewers, then you need to set up that moment early on. The earlier something is set up, the more impactful the payoff will be. Later on in this video, I explain why having a plan for the entire trilogy was so important, and it's largely because of setups and payoffs. In Lord of the Rings, the very first scene tells the audience how powerful the ring is and why it needs to be destroyed. So when it eventually happens three movies later, that is roughly 11 hours that it took to pay off what was set up in the prologue. In Avatar The Last Airbender, you're told right from the start that Aang will need to master all the elements to defeat the Fire Lord. So when it eventually does happen, happen, that was three seasons and 60 episodes of time it took to pay off that setup. If we look at the Star Wars sequels, there is absolutely no hints whatsoever that Palpatine was alive and pulling the strings before the Rise of Skywalker. Episode 9 begins with us learning he is alive and that he created Snoke and that he had some master plan for the First Order. The writers thought that this would retroactively add three movies of setup to the moment Palpatine is defeated, but it doesn't. Again, there is no mention of Palpatine being alive in The Force Awakens and the the Last Jedi. And frankly, there isn't even a mention of someone secretly pulling the strings. In The Empire Strikes Back, Vader's reveal that he's Luke's father works because throughout the two movies up until that point, we had on numerous occasions been told about Luke's father. Luke asked about his father plenty of times, and we were told supposedly how great of a man he once was, and that Darth Vader supposedly killed him. So when the reveal happens, it is paying off two movies of setup that the viewer didn't even know was set up. If throughout the two movies, Luke kept on asking about his father, and then Vader says, no, I am your stepbrother, it wouldn't be the best twist in history because not once did Luke mention a stepbrother. And this is the core of why Palpatine's return doesn't work. This movie treats Palpatine's death as the climax of the trilogy when it's only the climax of this movie. If you try to pay off something that wasn't set up properly, then your payoff will fall flat on its face. Let's say there's a hypothetical world out there where the sequels were planned and the writers knew from the start that Rey killing Palpatine would be the climax of the trilogy. You can drop hints here and there that there is some secret mastermind controlling Snoke in the First Order. This mystery man and how dangerous he is, is often discussed by our main characters throughout the first two movies. So come the third movie when it is revealed that this mystery man is Palpatine, it would work far better because the setup had happened far earlier in this story, and not just thrusted upon us in the beginning of the last movie. Now, as you may have noticed, I have yet to talk about anything that Palpatine actually did in this movie, other than die. Well, frankly, nothing that Palpatine could have done in this movie could have ever worked. Worked. The presentation of Palpatine in this movie is actually quite cool. His aesthetic is so creepy and well done. We see firsthand how powerful he is. It's kind of memed, but I do genuinely love the moment where he shoots all the lightning into the sky. And most importantly, Ian McDermott's acting is fantastic. But none of that matters for all the reasons I have explained for the past few minutes. The Rise of Skywalker is a prime example of how important proper setup is. And had Palpatine's return been set up, then maybe this could have worked. But as it currently stands, Palpatine's return does not work.
Continuing on the topic of the main characters in this movie, let's talk about Rey because she is the main character. Now, I would highly recommend watching my Force Awakens and my Last Jedi videos if you haven't already. In those videos, I cover Rey's story up to this point and all its strengths and flaws. But if I had to summarize all that I had to say in those two videos about Rey, Rey's story up to this point has always been about finding belonging. In The Force Awakens, Rey begins the story rotting away on Jakku waiting for her parents. She believes the only way to fill that hole in her heart is with her parents. But as the movie progresses, she learns that she's not going to find belonging by sitting on her ass on Jakku her whole life. She needs to accept the truth that her parents won't ever come back and that she needs to find her identity elsewhere. So come The Last Jedi, she initially looks to Luke for that belonging, but because Luke was a dick, she then turns to Kylo. Throughout their bonds, Rey realizes both of them struggle with abandonment and their relationship to their parents. She tries to find that belonging with him, but Kylo will only do that on the dark side. She also learns that her parents are nobody and that she alone needs to define what her place is in the galaxy, not other people. So come the rise of Skywalker, what is her story about? Rey begins the rise of Skywalker as someone who is wildly insecure about herself. After the events of the first two movies, she has essentially been knighted as the chosen one for the Resistance. She is a Jedi, she is being taught by Leia Organa, she holds the legendary Skywalker lightsaber, and everyone looks to her. But Rey doesn't feel worthy of any of this. She has dark visions of herself where she becomes a Sith, she can't complete a simple training course, she can't hear the voices of the Jedi before her, and she's accidentally injuring those around her. So when she hands Leia the lightsaber back, she says, I will earn your brother's saber one day, implying she thinks she doesn't deserve it. Rey proceeds to make dumbass decisions and plenty of mistakes throughout the rest of the movie. After she learns that she is the granddaughter of Palpatine, she concludes that the reason she's making all these mistakes is because she was destined to be a Sith Lord. But Luke helps her out and tells her some things are stronger than blood. This gives Rey the motivation to confront Palpatine and kill him. Rey overcame her biggest fears of herself, and when it mattered most, she resisted the dark side and saved the galaxy. She began the film feeling unworthy of being a Jedi, yet when it mattered most, the voices of the Jedi before her reached out and said they would always be with her. It didn't matter that she was the granddaughter of Palpatine, or that she was destined to be a Sith. The Jedi were with her. The Rise of Skywalker has a multitude of issues that I will cover throughout this video, but one of the aspects of this movie that was done alright was Rey's story. There was a clear progression of her character throughout the movie. She learned a message that is fundamentally Star Wars, and she overcame her biggest fears. The aspect of Rey that I was the most critical about in her first two movies was that she never faced any external struggles. Rey was an incredibly flawed individual, she had serious identity issues, and she was wildly insecure, and she often let her emotions get the better of her. So while she had all these flaws, she never suffered any consequences because of those flaws. If we look at Luke and Anakin, they both suffered immensely because of their flaws. Luke got beaten up in The Empire Strikes Back, and Anakin nuked his life beyond repair. Rey never had those moments in the first two films, and The Rise of Skywalker pretty much continues this trend. Yeah, Rey has some external struggles, like when she fights Kylo and loses, but it's not all that powerful. I'm gonna go through a list of all the incredibly dumb decisions Rey made in this movie, and how she pretty much avoided all consequences. And may I add, her making dumbass decisions is a flaw of her character. It's part of her arc that she keeps making mistakes and keeps doubting herself, so at the end of the movie, she can overcome all of that. But anyway, the first dumbass decision she made was confronting Kylo in the desert. Frankly, to this day, I still have no clue what her goal was here. Did she just feel like she had to see Kylo? Did she need to confront him again? Regardless of her reasoning, she is well aware that the First Order is actively chasing them, yet she decides to waste time and go into the desert anyway. Now, Rey almost suffered the consequences of her decisions. It appears that Chewbacca died because of Rey's stupidity. But no, it turns out he was alive and well. Chewbacca being alive robs Rey of facing any serious consequences. Dumbass decision number two. She leaves her friend so she confront Kylo about Palpatine. She is on a First Order Star Destroyer, and when she confronts Kylo, she's surrounded by like a hundred stormtroopers. What did she think was gonna happen here? Did she think she could walk away if she rejected Kylo again? Well, none of it matters because her friends were there to save the day. Once again, Rey is robbed of any realistic consequences. Dumbass decision number three. She goes to the Death Star by herself. Because she is impatient as fuck, she goes by herself, finds the Wayfinder, but because she's so mentally unstable at this point, she drops the Wayfinder and Kylo destroys it. So at first it appears she suffered those consequences, she just sabotaged the entire mission because she went to the Death Star by herself. But no, later on it turns out she can just take Kylo's second Wayfinder to get to Exegol anyway. And her fourth and final dumbass decision was flying away to Ahch 2 and destroying the TIE Fighter. I get that she was scared of herself and that she wanted to exile herself, but it's still a dumb decision. But she faces no consequences because, well, it turns out Luke's X-Wing that has been underwater for years is perfectly safe to fly. But even with the issues I have had with her story, I cannot for the life of me understand why people 
people can still call her a Mary Sue. Yes, she is ridiculously powerful. So what? So many people in Star Wars are ridiculously powerful. But Goldman, she was able to hold a fleeing ship and she can do a Jedi mind trick and she can shoot lightning and she can kill Palpatine all with little training. People who call Rey a Mary Sue have moved the goalposts so many times about what a Mary Sue is that I lost count. First, it was about her being perfect and never making mistakes and never losing a fight and being liked by everyone and being strong with the Force unrealistically that made her a Mary Sue. Then it was about her beating up some guards and lifting rocks with no training that made her a Mary Sue. Then in the Rise of Skywalker, it begins with her training and she's still a Mary Sue because she's stronger in the Force than she was in The Last Jedi. When I bring up that this argument also makes Luke a Gary Stu, people actually use him blocking bolts from a training ball as an example of training. But Goldman, he trained with Yoda. Yes, yet a year later, he managed to defeat Darth Vader in a lightsaber fight. You know, the guy who was the chosen one. But Goldman, he trained for a year between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Okay, he trained, but with who? He didn't go back to Yoda. He didn't have any Jedi texts. So who did he train with? But none of that matters. People just accept it because he's Luke Skywalker. But we see Rey train, and she's still a Mary Sue because she didn't get enough training? <laughs> There's just no winning with you people. And you know what? Rey is so powerful that she still managed to lose to Kylo in the lightsaber fight. I don't care that she stabbed him. Kylo had beat her and was ready to kill her before Leia intervened. When Kylo beat Rey, I was so happy because it vindicated everything I said about the fight from The Force Awakens. Rey only beat Kylo in that movie because Kylo was an emotional wreck. Flash forward to The Rise of Skywalker, Rey is significantly stronger than her Force Awakens counterpart, but she still lost to Kylo because Kylo at that point was emotionally stable. I can go on and on providing examples of how flawed Rey is, but this isn't a Mary Sue defense video. I already made that video. So to wrap up this portion about Rey, I'm going to talk about two instances of this movie that should have been powerful but weren't, and that's Rey defeating Palpatine and Rey taking the name Skywalker. Rey defeating Palpatine on paper should be the climactic moment of her arc. For three movies, she has struggled with finding belonging. Rey wanted nothing more than to be with her family again. Palpatine is the only family she has left. Everything she has ever wanted is being offered to her. Yet she learns that family can come from others than people who share your blood. She rejects Palpatine and defeats the only person left in her biological family. Also, she felt unworthy of being a Jedi. Yet all the Jedi came to her and supported her. So why doesn't this moment have the emotional impact that it should? Well, because Palpatine was not set up to be the proper obstacle for Rey. This goes back to what I said in the previous part. Defeating Palpatine simply doesn't work as the climax of this trilogy, and thus the climax of Rey's story doesn't work as well. You can't retroactively make something the obstacle of someone's story when it wasn't introduced beforehand. Now what about Rey Skywalker? Similar to what I said before, Rey has been searching for belonging this whole time, and now she adopts the name Skywalker, which is symbolic of her rejecting the notion that she is defined by blood, and that she acknowledges she can choose her own family. The idea of found family is a powerful theme in Star Wars. Just watch Star Wars Rebels. But the reason this moment doesn't have the emotional weight it should is because, well, choosing the name Skywalker is kinda strange. As thousands of people have pointed out, Luke was a dick to Rey, and she didn't have a great relationship with him. Did she choose the name Skywalker because of the one pep talk Luke gave her? I think it would've worked better if Rey simply just said, I'm Rey that she didn't need some last name to feel like a part of a family. I think that taking the name Palpatine would have been incredibly dumb because her story is not about changing the reputation of the Palpatine name. So staying as just Rey would have worked best. And that is the conclusion of Rey's story in the Star Wars sequel trilogy. I've always felt that Rey is an incredibly underrated character. Maybe it's just because of the experiences that I've gone through with my life and the themes that I value most from Star Wars, but Rey's story resonates with me deeply and I will always cherish that. But that does doesn't mean I don't see the clear flaws with her story, and I totally understand why most people don't care for her. But even with all its many flaws, I am satisfied with the way her story has wrapped up, but hopefully there will be more to come. Up next, we have Kylo Ren, aka Ben Solo. Upon my most recent rewatch of this movie, I realized that Kylo doesn't really do much in this movie. He's not someone who is driving the plot forward all that much. He kind of just follows Rey the whole movie and tries to convince her to join him. The movie begins with Kylo first finding Palpatine, then he talks to Rey, then he force fights with Rey, then he talks to Rey and force fights with her, then he talks to her, then he talks to her again and actually fights her. So prior to his conversation with Han, 
he doesn't do much. We don't even really see any signs of him still being conflicted until he's talking to Rey on the Death Star. Now, is this a bad thing? Not really. He's already had an incredible amount of development in the first two movies, so he doesn't need to do a whole lot more here. Some say that Kylo recreating his mask is a regression of his character, but I disagree. In my mind, he started to put it back together when he realized he was going to be talking to Rey again, kind of to hide any vulnerability he may have. One topic of discussion about Kylo in this movie is whether or not he should have turned back to the light side. So many people championed Kylo staying on the dark side and dying evil. Sure, this would have been a more unique take on the character, but I fundamentally disagree. I feel it was of the utmost importance that Kylo turned back to the light side. Of course, one of the major reasons is that redemption is a fundamental theme of Star Wars, but not every villain needs to be redeemed. I get that. Also, I probably should have added this to my portion about Rey, but another lesson Ben Solo's redemption teaches us is the importance of compassion. As I stated before, Kylo felt incredibly lonely and like everyone betrayed him. He's murdered good people and hurt plenty of others. Rey has absolutely no reason to believe in Kylo. Sure, she knows his struggles more than most, but she gave Kylo a chance to be good and he didn't take it in The Last Jedi. Again, Rey has every reason to hate Kylo, especially since he was about to kill her, yet she still showed him compassion. Luke showed Vader unconditional compassion and Vader turned back to the light side. Rey showed Ben that same compassion and he turned back to the light side as well. People love to talk about bad guys becoming good again, but they don't talk about the people who actually did the toughest deed, and that's show love to someone who doesn't deserve it. I think most people would be surprised what happens when you show compassion to someone who doesn't deserve it. Rey and Luke's unconditional compassion is something that I love about Star Wars, and The Rise of Skywalker reminded me of that lesson. But I still wouldn't say this is the most important reason why Ben Solo needed to turn good. So the main reason why it is so important that Kylo turned back to the light side is because of Han's death. Han basically sacrificed himself to save his son. If he never walked onto that bridge and confronted Kylo, then Kylo would have never realized how much he actually loved his parents and thus never turned back to the light side. The moment Han touched Kylo's face was the moment that would haunt Kylo straight up until the moment where he's on the Death Star. If Kylo died in the Rise of Skywalker on the dark side of the Force, then Han died for nothing. How depressing of a message does that send? Han risked his life to save his son, but it didn't matter. Sure, you can say that's more realistic, but that's not Star Wars. Leia saw hope in her son, but she was wrong too. Kylo also was never truly evil. He was just masking all the pain he had. So Kylo dying evil just doesn't sit right with me. So when Kylo threw his lightsaber away and became Ben Solo, I couldn't have been happier. Speaking of this scene, it is by far the best scene of this movie. For one, Adam Driver's acting is fantastic as usual, but more importantly, Ben replaying this moment with Han and making the right decision is so beautiful. But gold man, Han Solo wasn't a ghost, he was just a figment of Kylo's imagination. So in a way, Kylo forgave himself and that's his redemption? This is such a shallow analysis of the scene. Imagining a person in front of you who is no longer alive and getting something off your chest is a popular technique used by therapists to help people with depression. I've read comments from people who say that they got into a big fight with a loved one and then that loved one died. The guilt that plagued these people because their last conversation with their loved one was a fight was overwhelming. I highly recommend after this video you watch a video from Cinema Therapy talking about this scene. A real therapist talks about the technique portrayed in The Rise of Skywalker and how it's helped a lot of people. We have something that we need to tell somebody, but they're not around to hear it. Maybe they've passed away. Maybe they're no longer in our lives because that bridge is burned, or maybe it's not safe to talk to them anymore. But we carry these intense feelings inside, feelings of remorse, regret. So Ben does something in Rise of Skywalker that's actually a real therapeutic exercise. He talks to someone who isn't there. So in his imagination, Ben gets to relive those final moments with his father and do it right. He also gets the cathartic release of all these repressed emotions. He turns back to the light. It helps him to heal. Kylo Ren is gone and only Ben remains. So next time you say this movie is dumb because Kylo forgave himself, just know that many people suffering from depression have done something similar. So moving on, Kylo Ren is now Ben Solo and we're at the end of the movie. Amongst the people who love the sequels, the way Ben Solo's story ends is incredibly controversial. There are some aspects of it that I really like. Again, Adam Driver's acting is fantastic. You can just tell purely through body language that this isn't the same man as Kylo Ren. I also do like the connection that 
that Ben's last moments have with Anakin, Anakin wanted to cheat death so he could save the ones he loved. So Ben Solo finally accomplished what Anakin started. He cheated death by giving his life for Rey. So that's a connection that was kinda neat, even though the movie doesn't specifically make that connection. With that being said, Ben Solo dying breaks my heart. Every time I watch this movie and I see Ben fall to the ground and disappear, I get genuinely sad. And not the kind of sadness like when a dog dies in a movie, the type of sadness that lingers with me and brings me great pain. As someone who has studied the sequel trilogy greatly, someone who has read all the novelizations of this movie and plenty of other material about Ben Solo, I can conclude that Ben Solo lived a miserable life. Yes, he had loving parents, but the dark side was a shadow over him for almost his whole life. Whether it was Palpatine or Snoke, someone had been manipulating him since he was a child. He felt incredibly abandoned by his parents, betrayed by his uncle, abused by Snoke, and just in general a lonely person. He connected with Rey so deeply because for once in his life, he felt like someone understood him. After all this pain and suffering he went through, he finally turns good, only for him to die. When he smiles at Rey after the kiss, that is the one time we ever see Ben smile in this whole trilogy. He finally found some semblance of happiness and then it was all ripped away. Now, I'm not here to argue whether or not Raylo is a thing. I made a 20-ish minute video on my thoughts on Raylo. So whether or not you think that Rey and Ben would have gotten together had he lived, it is undeniable that he at least cared for Rey on a deep level. Rey was someone who brought Ben happiness for once, and that only lasted a few hours. I just can't get that thought out of my head. But even if I wasn't so emotionally invested in this character, from a narrative and logical perspective, it makes every sense to keep him alive. From a narrative perspective, it's at least different from Vader's death and redemption, so then you can get a true redemption. In a way, redemption through death is a cop-out. Had he lived, then he would actively have to atone for his sins. He would have to go to the resistance and apologize, or he would have to go to some council or whatever and face the consequences of his crimes. Simply turning good is not a redemption. You have to actively work for it. And this is where the logical perspective comes in. If he's alive, then you can tell more stories with him. Ben Solo is clearly the most popular character in this trilogy. If Lucasfilm were to announce that Adam Driver was returning to play this character, people would go nuts because even sequel haters kinda like him. And if Adam Driver never wants to return to the role, then you can just tell his story in other ways, like animation. You know what's something that triggered me recently? I watched this interview with Martin Scorsese where he called Adam Driver the best actor of his generation. One of the best filmmakers ever said Adam Driver is the best of his generation. We had genuinely one of the greatest working actors today play the child of Han Solo and Princess Leia and they decided to kill him. Star Wars is not well known for its acting, but we had Adam Driver and now he's never coming back. God, I get so angry. I know, I know. I went on a huge tangent there. I told you guys how much pain Ben Solo's death brings me. So anyway, those are my thoughts on Kylo Ren's story in this movie. I love this character so much and I do love his story in this movie. I would just personally sacrifice so much if it means he could still be alive. Hey guys, before I continue on with this video, only 4.9% of my viewers are subscribed to this channel. So if you're enjoying this video, consider subscribing for more content like this. Thank you. Up next, we will discuss the rest of the important characters. Even though there are plenty of other characters to talk about, I don't feel like these characters do enough in this movie to warrant their own section in this video. So we'll begin by talking about Leia. Whenever discussing movies or shows, I always try to isolate what happened behind the scenes from the actual story. Because a story is a story, and whether or not an actor said something controversial, or the director said something controversial, or something else, it doesn't matter. When Gina Carano started talking about politics, everyone started changing changing their opinion on the character of Cara Dune, even though Cara Dune and her story had nothing to do with the political statements made by Gina Carano. But with that being said, the death of an actor is one of the few exceptions I have. Leia was supposed to be a fundamental part of this movie. Reports way back when were that Han would be the focus of the first movie, Luke would be the focus of the second movie, and Leia would be the focus of the third movie. But unfortunately, that never happened. Without a doubt, had Carrie Fisher lived, Leia would have shared a scene with Ben Solo 
and that would have been incredibly emotional. But life gets in the way, and that never happened. When I watch the Leia scenes in this movie, I find them to be incredibly awkward. Because in the back of my mind, I know Carrie Fisher was never actually there. So when I hear all these vague NPC lines of dialogue from Leia, it takes me out of the movie. Like when she says, hiding in the shadows from the very beginning, I just know that when Carrie delivered that line, she was talking about Snoke. Also, there's one random scene where Leia and Rose talk to Greg Gunberg's character, and she also says these random lines that, again, could have been totally used in another context. So Leia's scenes pretty much completely take me out of the movie. But I'm not going to hold that against the writers, because they did their best, and I still applaud that. But we can move on to a character they did have complete control over, and that was Finn. Finn's story in this movie makes me sad. In my last Jedi video, I made the argument that The Last Jedi didn't sideline Finn. While Finn's story was clearly far less interesting than Rey's story, he still had an entire half of the story devoted to him. He was the main focus of the First Order vs. Resistance plot, and regardless of whether or not it was done well, he did have a character arc. The Rise of Skywalker has none of that. Finn was sidelined in The Rise of Skywalker because he doesn't really do much. He doesn't have an arc in this movie, he just follows Rey around. Yeah, he kinda has this one subplot where he and Janna talk about defecting from the First Order, but that doesn't really go anywhere. Yeah, they both fight the First Order together, but Finn was already fighting the First Order, so nothing changed. Finn used to be a co-protagonist. If you watch The Force Awakens again, yes, Rey is the main character, but Finn wasn't a supporting character. He was also a protagonist of that story. He has an arc, and the story follows him for the most part. Two movies later, and he has been downgraded to a supporting character. Seeing Finn regress to someone who only cares about Rey is tough to see. I will never try to speak for the black community, but I cannot imagine they were happy to see the main black character chase a white girl around for the entire movie. So Finn wasn't ruined per se, but he is probably the biggest example of wasted potential. A stormtrooper turned Jedi is one of the coolest concepts ever introduced to Star Wars, and it didn't go anywhere. Let's talk about Poe next. Poe is a tough character for me to talk about because I don't have a strong opinion on him. He had an arc in The Last Jedi about becoming a leader, and that's kinda present here. The story seems to focus on him more than it does Finn, which is a criminal mistake. What fans got incredibly wrong about The Force Awakens was that a new trio of characters was made. The originals had Han, Luke, and Leia, the prequels had Padme, Anakin, and Obi-Wan, now the sequels had Rey, Finn, and Poe, right? Wrong. Rey and Finn were the clear protagonists of The Force Awakens, and Poe was a supporting character. People forget Poe was missing for like half of that movie, but fans kept on screaming that they wanted more Poe Dameron and that he was a part of the main trio, but they didn't realize that giving us more Poe would mean giving us less Finn. I like Poe, he's a fun character, but he should never be as important to the story as Finn. So seeing that he gets more screen time than Finn in this movie kinda bothers me. Besides that, I don't really have any problems with the character, it's just that the prominence of his character means a regression of another character, and I don't like that. Up next, we'll address Luke. One of the largest criticisms of this movie is that it's trying to fix The Last Jedi as much as possible. People look at things like Kylo repairing his helmet, or Rey no longer being a nobody, as attempts to fix The Last Jedi. And maybe the prominent example of that is Luke catching the lightsaber and saying, a Jedi's weapon deserves more respect. This is a clear reference to Luke tossing the lightsaber in the previous movie, but I fundamentally disagree that this is an attempt to fix his character. Luke in The Last Jedi went on an arc. He realized how powerful his legend is, and he sacrificed himself at the end of that movie to save and inspire the galaxy. He is a changed man from the depressed hermit he was at the beginning of that movie. So when he catches the lightsaber and makes a joke about himself, to me that's a logical progression of his character. Luke at the end of The Last Jedi would never toss the lightsaber away. So whether or not it was JJ's intention to fix The Last Jedi, I don't see it as that. Besides that, there's nothing else to really say about Luke. His wig looks awful. The scene where he lifts the X-Wing is a neat scene. Sure, it's kind of strange that he knows his X-Wing that's in the water can still be flown, but the payoff of him lifting an X-Wing after training all those years later in The Empire Strikes Back was neat. This movie, to me, doesn't change any of my opinions about him from The Last Jedi, so it doesn't bother me. Up next, we have Rose, and I'm conflicted on this. I'm not the biggest Rose fan, so I wasn't too upset that she didn't do much in this movie. But in the back of my mind, I believe the reason she had nothing to do here is because JJ wanted to cater to the fans. And the notion of sidelining a character because fans don't like her sits wrong with me mentally. As a storyteller, it is of the utmost importance to listen to criticism and try to be better. But straight up caving to a segment of fans who passionately hate Rose is a bad way to tell a story. Rose was not sidelined because the writers thought it would make for a better story. She was sidelined because of the backlash The Last Jedi got, and that's wrong. Up next, we have maybe one of the dumbest 
dumbest handlings of a character, and that's with Hux. What they did with Hux was so dumb. Yes, The Last Jedi kinda made him a goof, but you didn't need to make him a complete bitch in this movie. There is no reason why the character General Pride should exist. Just give Pride's role to Hux. Who cares if he was a goof in The Last Jedi? Without exaggeration, you can give the exact lines of dialogue that Pride has and give them to Hux, and the story would be better off. Seeing Hux yell, I'm the spy, because he wants Kylo to lose was so dumb, and then he just gets killed off never to be mentioned again. He is one of the few remaining characters that was there since the beginning of The Force Awakens, and he was just tossed aside like he didn't matter. Hux is another example of a character who was completely wasted. And those are all my main supporting characters I wanted to talk about. Some were done okay, and some were wasted. J.J. Abrams has made a lot of movies in his career, and most of those movies tend to have a quick pace. Regardless of what you may think of him as a writer, he is a talented director. In most of his films, scenes flow nicely together at a quick pace, sure, but not fast enough where it is jarring. The Force Awakens, for example, is a wonderfully paced film. Scenes don't drag on for too long, and the story knows when to speed up or slow down. With that being said, The Rise of Skywalker is arguably his worst paced film. I remember when I saw this movie for the first time and I felt like I was on crack. We were jumping from planet to planet without a real second to breathe. Some of the moments of these films don't hit as hard as they could have because the audience is processing so much. Sure, it's easy to put this all on J.J. Abrams because, well, he's the director and he was also a co-writer, but I'm gonna cut J.J. some slack here. Sure, he is still to blame largely for some of the dumb decisions this movie made, but what many people may not know is that this movie movie was incredibly rushed. J.J. Abrams was officially announced to be a part of this project in September 2017, so a little bit over two years before The Rise of Skywalker came out. This may seem like a fair amount of time to make a movie, and for the most part it is, but for a movie on the scale of The Rise of Skywalker, having around 28 months is an incredibly short amount of time. J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson each had over three years to make The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi respectively. George Lucas began working on the Phantom Menace five years before the movie came out, and then an entire three years for the two sequels. J.J. Abrams probably made one of the worst decisions of his career to come back to Star Wars. Not only did he barely have any time, but after The Last Jedi's reception, he had a lot of pressure on his shoulders. And unfortunately, The Rise of Skywalker shows plenty of symptoms for a story that was rushed. As I mentioned before, the pacing of this movie is whack, and oftentimes that can be attributed to a rushed movie. When a director is short on time, it's easy for them to look at a three minute scene where characters are just sitting around and talking and then cut that out. The scenes that slow down the pace often seem to be the least important and thus they land on the cutting room floor. When I rewatched this movie for the video, there was an incredibly minor detail I noticed. This movie has characters jump from planet to planet constantly and only twice do we actually see a ship land or take off. When the little ship lands on the Star Destroyer and when Rey lands on Exegol. And I'm not talking about including the scene where we get a montage of ships leaving the Resistance base. I'm talking about scenes with our main characters where they travel from one planet to another. And yes, sometimes we see ships on the ground and then the next shot is on a different angle of them barely in the sky. But I'm talking about shots where we physically see the legs of a ship land or take off. You guys may be thinking, well, Goldman, why the hell does this matter? Because little things like this are what can help the pacing. Remember in A New Hope when the movie devoted like an entire minute or two of just the Millennium Falcon landing on the Death Star? And then once the Falcon lands, our characters gather themselves before leaving the ship. In The Rise of Skywalker, it's usually ship on the ground, then ship in space, or ship in space, aerial shot, then characters on the ground, or ship is kinda landing, and then it cuts to people on the ground anyway. Remember in The Force Awakens when the Falcon first lands on Takodana, and Rey just runs out and takes a breath and enjoys the scenery? Or in Revenge of the Sith when Padme lands on Mustafar, and she just sits there for a moment gathering herself before confronting Anakin? These are moments that help the pacing of a movie. If done once in a while, it's not a big deal that a movie cuts from a character on the ground to them in space, but The Rise of Skywalker does this constantly. Maybe I'm reaching here, but that's just a thought I had that could improve the pacing. Moving on from the pacing, the script is a script that could have used a lot more polishing. And I'm not talking about plot holes, because even some of the best movies have plot holes, but this movie just makes some strange decisions. Like Palpatine's plan in this movie. First, he decides to broadcast the galaxy a message that basically says, hey, in a day or so, I'm gonna attack the galaxy. Why on earth? 
Earth would he announce this to the galaxy? Why not just wait until your entire fleet is ready to threaten the galaxy? Moving on, he tells Kylo he must kill Rey. Then it is revealed that he secretly wants Rey to go to Exegol. But what if Kylo did actually kill Rey? Then it is revealed that Rey needs to kill Palpatine for the Sith ritual to work. Then she ends up killing him anyway and nothing happens. What's so frustrating is that there are answers to these questions that are just not explained in the movie. In a typical Sith ritual, in order for the murderer to turn to the dark side, they need to kill out of hate. That's why Rey doesn't turn to the dark side at the end, or why Vader didn't even turn more to the dark side when he killed the Emperor. But of course, this movie doesn't explain it. Another string of strange decisions that was made was the entire Pasana sequence. Think about it. Literally everything that happens here is by coincidence. They land on the planet and the First Order is after them. Then by some miracle, Lando shows up and happens to point them in the right direction. Without Lando, they would have had no clue where to go. They go on this speeder chase and happen to fall in this quicksand pit, which also happens to have the secret Sith dagger that they're gonna need later. While they're in the cave, they run into a snake which happens to be injured so Rey can heal it, so by pure chance it can knock a hole into the wall so they can leave. Star Wars is prone to coincidences, sure. Hell, Qui-Gon found Anakin by complete coincidence. But the movies tend not to go overboard with it. The Rise of Skywalker is riddled with coincidence after coincidence. To me, all these coincidences just say that the writers didn't have the time to properly map out a sequence and just needed things to happen inorganically. A great storytelling technique I heard was that coincidences that help your heroes are bad and coincidences that hurt your heroes are good. So that's another aspect of this movie that feels rushed to me. But nothing is more offensive than what I feel is the worst line in Star Wars. The worst line in all of Star Wars is somehow Palpatine returned. Now, in the context of this movie, it makes perfect sense why Poe would say this. He knows jack shit about the Sith and what they can do. What makes this line so bad has nothing to do with the actual scene, but that we are not given any reason how Palpatine actually returned. I should have mentioned this before when talking about Palpatine. And no, saying dark magic and cloning is not a reason. What's so frustrating is that the damn book gives a pretty cool reason. He uses his knowledge he learned from Plagueis to cheat death, and then he transferred his essence into a clone body. Some of you may say this is dumb, but I don't know, it makes sense to me. If anyone in the history of the galaxy would find a way to cheat death, it would be Palpatine. But of course, the movie was rushed and we never got a valid explanation in the film. One other minor detail I noticed that instantly told me that this movie was rushed was the musical cue that plays after Palpatine dies. I'm gonna speed up the video to try to avoid copyright, but tell me if you recognize this music. You don't? How about now? Yep, they chose the music that plays during Luke's death as the music that plays during Palpatine's death. And I'm not just cutting out a 10 second segment. This is the exact rendition of the Force theme that plays. The exact one. I don't know if this was intentional or incredibly lazy, but you tell me which scene was more impactful with that cue. This last topic I'm gonna mention is not necessarily a symptom of a rushed script, but man, it is something that triggered me and I just need to include it in this video. The movie has five fake out deaths. One, I think, is too much because fake out deaths are dumb, but five? First we have Chewbacca's fake out death, then we have 3PO's. I count this because he did basically die by having his memory erased, but it was all restored later on, no problem. Then we have Kylo's first fake out death where he was stabbed through the chest, then we have another Kylo fake out death where he is casually thrown into the abyss, then we have Rey's actual death but was brought back to life. I just had to roll my eyes that they kept on doing this. But yeah, this movie was incredibly rushed, and I don't entirely blame J.J. Abrams. He was given just over two years to make this movie. I think Bob Iger is to blame. He was the one who demanded a two-year window between the sequel movies. Had JJ had more time, then maybe this movie could have been significantly better. Throughout my sequel trilogy series, I have discussed a topic that I felt applied to each movie of the sequels. In my Force Awakens video, I spoke about the world building of the sequels and why I found it to be lacking. In my Last Jedi video, I spoke about the reception of the sequels and what it needed to do to become a beloved era. And now in my Rise of Skywalker video, it is time I examine what is arguably the single most discussed topic about the sequel trilogy, and that is the lack of a complete plan. In 2012, when the sequel trilogy was greenlit, we all assumed that Cass 
Kathleen Kennedy and the storytellers had roadmapped the general story of all three sequel movies. So when The Force Awakens came out and that movie left us with a lot of questions, we assumed that the movie was made with answers already in mind. But by the time The Rise of Skywalker concluded, it was clear that there was no plan for this trilogy. The directors themselves have explained the process of this trilogy as sort of a passing of the baton. JJ told his story, then Ryan told his story, then Colin Javaro was going to tell his story until JJ came back and told another story. When The Force Awakens was made, there was almost no idea of what would eventually happen in the next two films. I want to take this time to examine why specifically this is such a problem. Because there have been plenty of trilogies in the past that weren't completely planned. Hell, even the original Star Wars trilogy wasn't planned out from the start. So why is it such an issue for the Star Wars sequels? What many people don't realize is how unique of a situation the sequel trilogy had. If you were to look at most trilogies in the history of cinema, they don't usually tell an overarching story. We'll use the Indiana Jones trilogy for example. The original trilogy of films are just three separate movies of an adventure Indiana Jones went on. You can watch the movies in any order you want, and neither movie leads into the next one. A similar but slightly different example would be the Alien trilogy. Yes, each movie is a clear sequel to its predecessor, but the trilogy doesn't follow one continuous story. You can just watch Alien and you'd have closure, or you can just watch Alien and Aliens and you'd have closure. The same could apply to the Terminator trilogy or the Dark Knight trilogy. A slightly different example would be the original Star Wars trilogy. If you were to just watch the first movie, it could be its own story. You'd have closure and there's really no need to watch the rest. But if you were to watch the second movie, then you would need to watch the third one to get closure. So in a way, the original Star Wars trilogy is not one overarching story. It consists of two complete stories. Episode 4 is one story and then episodes 5 and 6 are kinda one overarching story. An example that would not apply to this is the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Each film represents one part of an overarching story. You can't just watch Fellowship and Two Towers and call it a day. Each film is essential to the story and you need to watch all three in the right order. So why throughout history are most trilogies like Indiana Jones or Aliens or Star Wars? Well, because it is incredibly unlikely that a movie studio will greenlit three movies at once. In order for a trilogy to indeed be a trilogy, the first one needs to be successful enough so the movie studios feel it is a worthwhile investment to continue the series. And because usually only one movie is greenlit to begin with, that one movie will tell a self-contained story that doesn't need two other movies to complete the narrative. If three movies are greenlit at once, the writers know they don't need to tell a complete story in just the first movie. They can afford to leave story threads hanging for the sequels to resolve. Throughout history, it is incredibly rare that an entire trilogy will be greenlit from the start. The only examples that I can really think of are the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Hobbit trilogy, and the Star Wars prequel trilogy. So going back to each one of the trilogies that I mentioned, they were all planned from the start. Say what you will about the quality of the Hobbit trilogy or the Star Wars prequels, they do tell one contained narrative across three films. When you watch the third movie, it is a culmination of all three movies. So with that being said, I feel Star Wars fans subconsciously realized that the Star Wars sequels belong in this incredibly rare class of trilogies that were greenlit from the start. But Lucasfilm didn't take advantage of that incredibly rare opportunity. Now if Lucasfilm really wanted to, they could tell three self-contained stories and I don't think that would be a problem. But where the problem lies is with the rise of Skywalker. Remember before when I spoke about the Star Wars original trilogy? It was kind of two overarching stories. You had episode four and then episodes five and six. What's strange with the Star Wars sequels is that it's also two overarching stories, but those stories are the stories of episode seven and eight and then the story of episode nine. If you were to just watch episode seven, you would need closure with the next one. But if you were to only watch episodes seven and eight, I would argue there's some closure there. The only remaining narrative threads after The Last Jedi are simply what's gonna happen to these characters. So come episode nine, you can't really tell a story that's gonna pay off all three films. The previous two already had closure, so you need to tell one more story from scratch. But The Rise of Skywalker didn't do this. They marketed this movie as not only the end of this trilogy, but the end of a trilogy of trilogies. This was the end of the Skywalker saga and supposedly everything was gonna build up to this movie. But again, there's nothing that this movie could pay off that would reach the expectation of the end of a nine movie story. But they tried to do that anyway. They introduced Palpatine in this movie and said all along he was the big bad and it's time to destroy him. But there was no build up to it and thus it fell flat. The Rise of Skywalker treats this moment as the climax of this trilogy when it doesn't feel like it. I'm gonna use the same example here that I shared in the beginning of the video. Say from the start of the 
The Force Awakens, you had the exact same story, but Snoke occasionally made references to someone lingering in the shadows that was in charge of everything, including the return of the First Order. And then in The Last Jedi, you have the same exact story, but say Kylo tells Rey they need to team up together to defeat this mystery man that is pulling all the strings. And then in The Rise of Skywalker, we find out that all along, it was Palpatine himself that was this Phantom Emperor. When Rey eventually kills him, it's a payoff of all three movies because right from the start, it was set up that there was some mystery man our heroes would have to defeat. It's like the ring in Lord of the Rings. If the sequels had a plan, then the climactic moment of the trilogy could have three movies of payoff instead of one. And this is why the sequels needed a plan. They wanted Episode 9 to be the movie that would pay off everything, but there was nothing left to pay off because there was no plan. Now, even though The Last Jedi is my favorite of the sequels, I would argue that this movie is to blame. The Last Jedi didn't leave many narrative threads that could be paid off in a powerful way. The only way The Rise of Skywalker could have been successful with the current Episode 8 is if it tried to just tell a self-containing story that wasn't paying off an entire trilogy. But even then, Star Wars fans would still be disappointed that Episode 9 wasn't the payoff of an entire trilogy. Many point to the differing directors that the trilogy had as the problem, but I feel that's borderline irrelevant. If Kathleen Kennedy sat J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson in a room from the start and told them they need to tell one cohesive story, this could work. But that didn't happen. It got so bad that J.J. and Ryan played tug-of-war with the identity of Rey's parents. So in short, the reason why the Star Wars sequel trilogy needed a plan so badly is because they wanted to tell a story that would pay off big in Episode 9, but in order to pay off big in Episode 9, you need one cohesive story, and that didn't happen. Before I wrap up this video, I want to touch on an alternate universe that almost existed, and that is with the original Star Wars Episode 9 titled Duel of the Fates. If you're not familiar with what went on behind the scenes, a man named Colin Trevorrow was penned to write and direct Episode 9, but due to creative differences, he was let go and replaced by J.J. Abrams, and then J.J. made The Rise of Skywalker. Shortly after the release of The Rise of Skywalker, a script of Colin Trevorrow's original Episode 9 was leaked and thus sparked intense discussion, which was a better episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, or Duel of the Fates. Now before I compare the two, I will give two disclaimers. The Rise of Skywalker is obviously a completed film. This was a movie that was shot, edited, and its script went through multiple rewrites before its final version. The Duel of the Fates script is a first draft. There are a lot of plot holes or things that simply don't make sense. There are a lot of issues with this first draft because it is indeed a first draft. First drafts usually suck, so most likely not everything would have made it to the big screen. And the other disclaimer I'll give is that this first draft was sent to Lucasfilm in December 2016, right before Carrie Fisher passed away. The Duel of the Fates script did feature Leia heavily, so that likely would have changed. Those are the two big disclaimers I wanted to give. But with that being said, it's tough to decide which one I would have liked better, but I'm gonna give the edge to Duel of the Fates. And the major reason why is because Duel of the Fates just feels more epic. When you watch The Rise of Skywalker, would you say the final battle was epic? I wouldn't. This movie doesn't feel like the end of a saga. Every planet they visit is just some random ass planet that doesn't hold galactic importance. And the battles don't feel like battles. Just our friend running away and then we go to Exegol, which doesn't have the epicness of, say, Return of the Jedi's final battle. Duel of the Fates has a larger scope. Most notably, they go back to Coruscant, and that's the location of the final battle. Going back to this rundown version of Coruscant is an awesome way to connect the sequels to the prequels. The movie features a stormtrooper rebellion that takes place on the ground of Coruscant that is far cooler than the Battle of Exegol. Another huge reason I prefer Duel of Fates is because of Finn's story. Finn actually does something in that movie. The Stormtrooper Rebellion I mentioned was started by him, and it's a perfect culmination of his arc. Frankly, I would have liked this far better than him simply becoming a Jedi. Finn is not a supporting character in Duel of the Fates. He is a main character like he was in The Force Awakens. Also, this version of Episode 9 does better things with Rey. She's still a nobody and not related to Palpatine, which I like. She has a double-sided blue lightsaber which fits her character perfectly. Perfectly, and she gets her ass handed to her in this movie. She gets beaten up and is even blinded by Kylo at one point. Some of you will say that I'm a weirdo for wanting Rey to get hurt, but in the first two movies, her worst injury is a scratch on the shoulder. If you want the audience to respect her, she needs to get beat up and then overcome it. Also, Rey is just a lot cooler. The movie begins with her using her Jedi skills to mow down a bunch of stormtroopers. Fun fact, in all the sequel trilogy, the only time Rey uses the lightsaber in combat is to fight Kylo and the Praetorian Guard.
guards. She never kills a stormtrooper or any other bad guy with her lightsaber, besides Palpatine, I guess. Rey kinda lacks a cool factor that other characters like Ahsoka have. This movie also doesn't cave into fan feedback and sideline Rose, but most importantly, Duel of the Fates doesn't bring Palpatine back. This was the criminal sin of the Rise of Skywalker, and the fact that Duel of the Fates avoids this is a huge plus. There is a hologram of Palpatine that we see, but he's not actually alive. This story tries its best to pay off the previous two movies, unlike The Rise of Skywalker, which pays off a bullshit Final Order plotline. So those are all the things I liked far better in Duel of the Fates. But with that said, there are a few things that I like better in The Rise of Skywalker. For one, Kylo does turn back to the light side. As I stated before, I feel this is such an important part of the sequels that it not happening in Duel of the Fates is a big problem for me. Also in this story, Rey and Poe have a romance. This is so strange to me and should not be a part of the final story. This movie also does some other weird shit like introducing this 10,000 year old Sith Lord that is also just killed right away. But those are my thoughts on Duel of the Fates. Regardless of which one I would have liked better, I definitely feel more people would have been more receptive to Duel of the Fates. So, Star Wars Episode 9: The Rise of Skywalker, all these years later, how will it be remembered? There is a portion of this fandom that loves this movie with all their heart, and I couldn't be more happy for those people. But I think it's fair to say that this movie left a lot of fans just empty. All that excitement that existed in the fandom prior to The Force Awakens was lost, but a new hope did emerge. Even though this is nowhere near my favorite Star Wars movie, there is one aspect of this movie that I am eternally grateful for, and that's my boy Claude. Claude. I hope you fix that surge. Re -op, re -op. If you've watched my videos before, you may have heard me conclude my videos by saying, don't forget to knight the Claude Squad. Yep, Claude is this dude, the mascot of my channel. And I even have a cardboard cutout of this beauty of a creature that sits in my room every day. <laughs> God, I love Claude. But to everyone watching, feel free to check out some of my other Star Wars years later videos. Thank you everyone so much for watching another one of my videos. Don't forget to unite the Claude Squad, and I will see you guys next time.